Hi there, Marvin Kilborn back again, um, retired public school teacher. This video is going to be part two of my two video series on Holsey Middle School in South Oak Cliff, Dallas. In my last video, the first video, I had mentioned that Holsey was the lowest performing, most undesirable, most violent, lowest performing uh, middle school of all the 38 middle schools in Dallas, at least at that time, 2008-2009. Holsey was so bad, uh, had a very, very tough time finding and keeping teachers. Uh, kids were rough, most of them. Uh, they had substitutes. If they showed up once, they typically didn't show up again. I've got a, a lot of stories I could tell about Holsey. And a few years back, I'd started writing a book about my experiences as a teacher. And if I ever get around to finishing that, um, might include a lot more than I'm going to share on this video. Uh, I had not mentioned in the first video that Holsey was an academically unacceptable school. Um, academically unacceptable schools are just the uh, very low performing schools, uh, way below the uh, state average. For example, I taught seventh grade math and uh, the five year running average for the pass rate on the seventh grade state test was only 42 percent. So pretty bad. Um, average would be around 80 percent maybe. Um, I know for Algebra 1 it's 83 percent. Seventh grade math maybe a little lower, I don't know. But anyway, it was a, a pretty rough place to teach. Um, I have to say all things considered, I, I really enjoyed it there. Um, I got along great with my kids even though you know I was like a you know, just the, the one white guy and the only white teacher most of these kids had. I was one of only four or five white teachers in the whole school. But I actually got along great with the kids. Uh, mainly that was part of because of my personality and my teaching style. Uh, one of the interesting things, it was made fairly clear to me that all teachers were expected to teach the same way according to their subject. Like I taught seventh grade math. There were three of us, two other teachers that also taught seventh grade math, and we were expected to all teach it the same way. Problem was, we didn't have any collaborative type meetings where we would get together and share lessons or actually plan out what we were going to teach, when we were going to teach it, or how we were going to teach it. So I don't know how we were expected to teach it the same way. Well, so I certainly didn't. Um, I have my own teaching style, uh, teaching in the inner city teaching these children. I wanted to make my lessons fun and engaging. I incorporated a lot of fun activities. You can actually watch some of the earlier Holsey videos that I posted. There you'll see a lesson that I used uh, sour candy stripes to teach fractions. Uh, you'll see tricycle races. I used that to teach geometry and measurement. But I did all kinds of things. I used chocolate milk, cookies, relay races, tricycle races, uh, can different kinds of candy, pound cakes. I had I, I created all these lessons incorporating all these fun activities to where the kids would have fun while they were learning and actually learn while they were having fun. And they did. I was very successful. The students really looked forward to coming to my class. And even though a lot of these kids maybe misbehaved badly in other teachers' classes, I didn't, for the most part, have the same problems. I mean, there were occasions, but for the most part, I, I didn't have the same kinds of problems. For the kids would, would look forward to coming to my class. Um, as an example of that, my assistant principal, Mr. Dwayne Sadbury, he was a great, great guy, one of the very administrators I've worked with. That was just awesome. And I remember he came to my class one day. He said, Mr. Kilburn, I want to share this with you. We're having to do a whole bunch of realignments, changing student schedules around. And he said, the one thing I keep hearing from the students is, hey, you can change me to any, change my schedule around any way you want. Just don't take me out of Mr. Cla Mr. Kilborn's class because he's my man. <laughs> so that was pretty cool. Um, there was one day I was teaching, I forget exactly what I was talking about, but one of the black girls, and, and keep in mind, this is a 900 students, 85% black, 15% Hispanic. Uh, you know, I mean, it's a heavily, heavily black populated school. And I, again, I don't remember exactly what we were talking about, but one girl popped up, oh, Mr. Kilborn, you're as black as the rest of us. And I just kind of laughed and said, oh, okay. 
So, yeah, and that was it. I didn't, I didn't, I don't remember commenting any more on that, but I, I definitely, for, for some reason, I actually kind of took that as a compliment. I took it to mean that, that they had embraced me, they had accepted me and, and, and enjoyed interacting with me. I don't know as a teacher, I don't know if you can ask for more. You want your kids to learn, but you also want them to feel comfortable in the classroom and feel, feel at home. And, and that's what I like to do. Like I said, there's a lot of stories I could tell. I'm trying to keep this video fairly short because I do have a tendency to go on. Um, I know one thing about the school. It was, uh, it was built, it must have been built to be like a bomb shelter or something. I mean, it was three stories tall. It had a basement floor, a, a first floor and a second floor. Sixth graders were on the basement, seventh graders on the second or first floor, and then eighth graders were upstairs. And for some weird reason, there were no emergency lights in the building, or certainly not in the classrooms. So whenever there would be a powder out, power outage, I mean, that school was pitch black. And the kids apparently could see in the dark, because when the power would go out, they'd start throwing stuff and running up and down the hallway, slamming on the lockers. I mean, it just got, it got nuts. Well, it only took the first power outage for me to learn. So what I did was I went out and bought some UPS systems, uninter uninterruptible battery power backup systems, and I installed some tree lights in my room and basically lit my room and, and plugged those into the UPS system. So the next time the power went out, my light stayed on, my overhead projector stayed on, my computer stayed on. I just kept on teaching. And that shocked the principals because when the power would go out, they'd grab their flashlights and go patrolling the hallways. And it was funny. They commented, wow, we walked into Mr. Kilborn's class and he, he was still teaching. Apparently, I was the only teacher in the building that had, had thought to do something like that. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of stories, both good and bad. Uh, I remember once my second year, there was uh, two eighth grade boys that raped a sixth grade girl in one of the bathrooms. Mr. Ayala, the principal, he didn't want to do anything about that. So the parent had to get the police involved to actually do some kind of investigation. That was pretty sad. Anyway, back to, um, like I said, it was made clear to me that we were expected to teach the same way, but we didn't have any planning sessions to do anything like that. So again, I just taught my, my I taught my way. I uh, did the best, talked to the best of my ability and created all those lessons for the kids to have fun while they were learning. Um, I mentioned in my first video, the last day of the year or, the, or that last day when only teachers go in, Mr. Ayala had called me into his office and essentially accused me of being a racist. And I asked him, you know, who's accusing me of this? What teacher is turning me in or who's turning me in? What are the specific allegations? Why do you, why does somebody think I'm racist? And uh, he told me he didn't want to get into details and didn't want to tell me who, who was accusing me of this. So I just told him, well, if you're not willing to give me that information, then don't bother me with this nonsense again. Well, sadly, the very next year, it, it happened again. I want to say it was, I think it was either before Thanksgiving or before Christmas. I don't specifically remember what, when. But Mr. Ayala called me into his office and he asked me, he goes, Mr. Kilborn, how, you know, I got to ask you, what is your opinion of black people? How do you feel about black people? Well, not only was that just really an inappropriate question, I mean, it's none of his business how I feel about black people, and it's pretty insulting. But I, I told him that, look, I have no problem with black people, brown people, any people at all. I served in the military for 22 years. I've worked with all kinds of ethnicities and racial groups. I, I just could care less about skin color. I mean, there's more things to be concerned about than the color of somebody's skin. And hey, we can't help how we were born. So it's just, it just never made much sense to me. Plus, I just wasn't raised to, to look at people badly just because of the color of their skin. So I didn't. And I asked again, I asked him, uh, who's bringing this to your attention? Who is accusing me of this? What, what are spe specific allegations? What have I said or done to make anybody think that I might be racist? And he told me again, I don't want to get into any details. <laughs> well, you know, sir, you need to leave me alone with this. And said it's, it's inappropriate and just leave me alone. But it, oh, he also mentioned, Mr. Kilburn, you live in Tyler. And said there must be at least 20, 30 different school districts between Tyler and Dallas that, that you could go to work for. That was somewhat insulting. I and mean, if, if he felt like that, he knew I lived in Tyler when he hired me the year before. So why did he go ahead and hire me? 
But here's the thing. I'm gonna, I can tell you I'm, I'm not a racist. I can't prove I'm not a racist. All I can tell you is I'm not a racist, and it's up to you as to whether to believe it or not. But look at it this way. I mean, I live in Tyler, Texas. It was essentially a four-hour round-trip drive for me to get to work every day. I knew the demographics of the school. I knew it was 85% black. I knew it was 15% Hispanic. I knew it was in, in the South Oak Cliff area of Dallas, not exactly a, uh, a desirable area of Dallas. I knew exactly what I was getting myself in to. So I guess the question is, I'd have to be a pretty damn committed racist <laughs> to put myself through a four hour round trip and teaching pretty much predominantly in a black school. It was just insulting for him to uh, accuse me of that. Um, I remember once they had, a, this was before the state test, and the principal Ayala, Roberto Ayala, decided for some reason to have like a, like a pre-test pep rally, and which isn't a horrible idea, get the kids kind of pepped up and excited about taking the test and do the best they can. But one thing he decided to do was have a basically what could only be referred to as a gangster rap concert for these kids. You know, this rap group came in and they were singing pretty, pretty, dis, pretty disgusting lyrics. But it was going fairly well. I mean, these kids listen to that kind of music. So it wasn't like they were being shocked by anything. But at the point when the rap group started throwing out CDs into the crowd that almost caused a damn riot in the school. That was that was nuts. All us teachers had to jump into action to tear the kids apart from each other. I mean, they were fighting over these CDs. Well, they they put a, a stop to the little rap concert right away. You know, it's just ridiculous. It, it just once again shows that these administrators, a lot of the at least in Mr. Ayala's case, didn't seem to know his audience. I mean, he was Hispanic himself, but he certainly didn't live in the South Oak Cliff area. So crazy for him to even attempt something like that. Um, Holsey was a violent place again. Uh, it was one of the, the roughest schools in the in the whole district. Uh, one of the problems with Holsey is a lot of the kids misbehaved. There were fights almost every single day. Kids were disrespectful. Um, because of my teaching style, I, I kind of didn't have as big an issue as a lot of the other teachers did. But Holsey had a habit of accepting the worst behaved kids from other schools when they would get kicked out of those schools or get in so much trouble that the parents would decide to bring them to Holsey. And Holsey would gladly accept them. There was one boy, just one example. It was a boy who uh, was in a pretty decent school, um, but he got in trouble so much he was always on suspension. So his dad decided to withdraw him from that school and bring him over to Holsey, which would gladly accept him. And of course, the kid brought his behavioral issues with him. He was disrespectful to the teachers. He misbehaved. He got in trouble all the time. Um, when he first came, he was a seventh grade student. So when he first came to the school, they assigned him to another seventh grade math class. But he caused so much trouble in there that the teacher requested that he be moved out of the class. So they put him in my class. Now, for the most part, I didn't have a lot of trouble with him, but this was well after the school year had started. So I had things pretty under control in my classroom. And this kid, of course, wanted to come in and try to disrupt. So I would constantly have to remind him to sit down and behave himself, stay in his desk, pay attention, you know, not cause trouble and all this. Well, one day he decided I was I was right in the middle of teaching a lesson. He decides to jump up. He runs up in front of me and starts dancing around in front of me. Well, I grabbed his shoulder and nudged him. I didn't push him. I didn't shove him. It wasn't a violent throw, but I kind of, you know, nudged him up toward Go sit back down. I don't remember his name. Go sit back down. Well, he, he walks over to his desk and he falls to the ground. Of course, all the other kids are laughing. I went over and helped him up, asking him, hey, what happened? You okay? Well, it was ridiculous. And I didn't think anything more of it. He sat down and we finished class. And then later in the day, Mr. Ayala brings a substitute to my class and asks me to go with him. We go back down to his office. What had happened was this boy had called his dad and accused me of hitting him and knocking him to the ground. 
Well, Mr. Ayala, I guess, felt like he needed to do something about this. So they had to do some kind of investigation. So Mr. Ayala assigned me to report to the district disciplinary office. I forget exactly what it was called, but it was basically a disciplinary type place where teachers and administrators that had been accused of stuff had to show up to this building and sign in and wait around for some so-called investigation to be done. Well, I wasn't worried about the investigation. I mean, I hadn't done anything wrong. My students and I had a great relationship and they were right there. They saw what happened. So I don't know who else the principal or investigators were going to talk to, but my students to find out what happened. But the thing that pissed me off about it was I'm making a four hour round trip to do a job and I really didn't mind doing the drive in order to perform a, a function to do my job. While I was undergoing this so-called investigation, what I was expected to do was drive all the way to inner city, the center of Dallas, sign in, and then go home. <laughs> so a four hour round trip for no other purpose but to just sign in. And then I would go home and, and await the outcome. Well, after making the whole trip, you know, I would stand around and I would visit. It was amazing how many, I mean, there were literally hundreds of teachers and administrators that would have to show up here every morning and, and sign in waiting for the outcome of an investigation. I talked to a lot of, a lot of these people, some pretty heartbreaking, pretty sad stories kind of felt like, well, I'm in the, I'm in the same boat with the rest of you. I've been falsely accused of something. Well, this went on for two weeks and uh, the head guy at the disciplinary center called me into his office and report to my office when you get here in the morning. I went in, he asked me, are you ready to go back to work? I said, man, I, I was, I've always been ready to go back to work. I shouldn't even be here. Anyway, he just said, well, you're to report back to work tomorrow morning. No apologies, no explanations, no discussion about what happened or what was discovered. Just go back to work. Crazy, just a crazy thing. But it, it, it was my, <laughs> I was definitely made aware at that point that teachers are very, very vulnerable to being accused, even falsely, of all manner of things. And then the district feels the need to, and maybe they're bound by law to, I don't know, but they have to uh, do an investigation. So teachers are, teachers are vulnerable. Another story I want to tell quickly is about Black History Month. Um, Black History Month, as we know, is in February. Um, there's a very good reason why it's in February. And actually up until 1976, it was Black History Week. And the week was chosen, I forget the exact dates, I think it's the 12th and 19th of February. You can Google that to make sure. But basically the, the week of February that was chosen was the same week that Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass were born in. They shared birthdays in the month of February. So when they came up with this Black History Week, it was decided that that would be the week that, that they would celebrate Black History because of Abraham Lincoln and his relationship with Fred, Frederick Douglass, both abolitionists. So anyway, later on in 1976, it became Black History Month. And I already told you why that was. It was because of the birthdays. Well, Mr. Ayala decided to have a Black History Assembly, which isn't a, a bad thing. Most schools do this. Um, it's good to, to honor the uh, contributions and, uh, of any racial group, for that matter, not just Blacks, but Hispanics, Whites, and anybody else. But they had this big assembly, and the first speaker was this local Black preacher. He was an older Black man. And he got up and immediately started talking about Black History Month. And one of the first things he said was, you know what? He said, they gave us the shortest month in the year to celebrate our heritage. But you know what? We're used to it. We're used to being shortchanged in this country. Disgusting, absolutely disgusting. I mean, it's bad enough we got people like Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson, all these race hustlers that make a living, a very lucrative living out of perpetuating hatred in the black community of the black man of the white man and 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 the government and some of this stuff is true we know our history we should know our history but it makes no sense to me to keep perpetuating this hatred this black minister preacher was talking to a bunch of impressionable 11th 12th and 13 year old kids that live in essentially the ghetto i mean it's a rough area just disgusting well, anyway, earlier I was talking about how uh, I was expected to teach the same way and I decided not to. Um, 
said there was only a 42% average pass rate on the seventh grade math test. So here's what happened at the end of the year. We had the, the state testing week. We got the results of the state tests and just seventh grade math. It was me and two other teachers that, that taught seventh grade math. My students, 70% of my students passed the seventh grade state math test. Now that may not sound great, only 70%. I would certainly like to get a whole lot more higher. I mean, I'd like to have 100% all of my students pass the test. And that was always my goal as a math teacher throughout my entire career. But for this school in this area, 70% was, was pretty darn good. Um, to put that in perspective, the other two teachers, the one had a 30% pass rate and the other one had a 40% pass rate. No, actually, it was 42% pass rate. 30, 42, I had a 70 even though that's not super, super awesome, it's a whole lot better than they'd ever done before. And I was actually expected to be congratulated by my principal. That wasn't to be. Um, we had a meeting, had a department meeting. Me, the principal, and the other two math teachers, Mr. Ayala, asked me why I had not taught math the same way as the other two seventh grade math teachers. I don't, I don't even remember giving him an answer. I do remember being flabbergasted. I was taken aback. Here I am sitting here hoping that he's going to congratulate me. And if anything else, he should be encouraging the other two math teachers to find out what I had done to get these great results. So I really didn't quite understand his, his point there. I just didn't, I just didn't get it. Well, we did have a meeting later, a private meeting, and Mr. Ayala shared with me that he had, he had already told me I was expected to teach the same way as the other teachers. We were expected to teach the same way. And he made no bones about it. He said, you know what? We're an academically unacceptable school. We get additional funding from the government because of that. If all of my teachers taught the same way you do, Mr. Kilborn, we'd be in danger of losing that funding. <laughs> Come on, man. If you're not disgusted with that way of thinking, we hear about how our inner cities fail or our schools fail our inner city kids, mainly our black children. And, and there's no doubt that, that that's happening. And with what I experienced, I actually believe it's by design. I believe in many ways the public education system is set up for failure or at least to be mediocre at best. It's not set up and designed for excellence and excellence isn't applauded, excellence isn't celebrated. And in the inner city, it's almost set up to fail and it's expected to fail. And if you're holding, if the government's giving extra money to failing schools, <laughs> so they're basically incentivized to remain failing schools. I don't know, I have to throw my hands up. Um, I would have enjoyed and uh, I would have liked to have stayed at Holsey, but certainly a year and a half of making a four hour round trip every day being accused of being a racist, <laughs> the, the kind of principle that, that I had, um, I'd had enough. My wife and I had actually put our house on the market. We were trying to sell it. And if we did sell it and could have moved closer to Dallas, I may, I may have stayed at Holsey. But we chose, uh, if you remember the Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae fiasco back in the 2008, 2009, it made it very difficult. We were never able to sell our house and move. So I decided to... Um, to try to find a job closer to home. So that's my some of my experiences at Holsey Middle School. My next video is going to be about my one year in the Brownsboro Independent School District. So until next time, uh, if you're watching my videos, I certainly appreciate it as always. Feel free to leave a comment. Feel free to subscribe. But until next time, thank you so much for, so much for watching. Bye-bye.